part four. And it's going to be broken into two parts, before lunch and after lunch. And it covers a, a large section and a nice section of the Dhruva story. As you see, these are the verses from chapter 8, verse 39 to verse 62. And on the left-hand side, there's a nice picture of Dhruva. And on the right-hand side is a nice photograph of the lotus feet of Radha Govinda, or Govindaji. Very nicely decorated lotus feet. The title of this section, Achieve the Lord, or Receive the Lord. And yesterday evening, there was a lot of attention being placed on the determination, establishing, in principle, the determination of Dhruva. Here's a little boy picking up a barbell. It looks like he's not going to be able to pick up that barbell. But the purpose for which Dhruva wanted to be successful was otherworldly. So it would going to definitely take a lot of determination. But is that sufficient? Just have lots of determination and you could achieve Krishna? Mercy is required along with determination. Here's a little review of what we've covered so far, particularly the, the second and third sections. The first was a summary, overview of the whole Dhruva story. The second dealt with uh, Suniti, the mother of Dhruva, hearing of the awful situation that had confronted him and her very wise transcendental advice. Um, here's one of the keys that we saw the first day. Suniti taught Dhruva to respond and not react because he was reacting with anger. And his reacting with anger was also retaliation. He wanted to get back at his stepmother. And she advised him, don't do that. Because you do like that, and the ill-wishing that you have towards another will come back to you. So don't. Instead, you should respond with a proper measure, because you want a kingdom, you want a kingdom that's not just your father's kingdom, but we'll hear more details, what he says to Narada. He wanted a kingdom that's better than his father, better than his father's father, and better than his father's father's father, who's Lord Brahma. He wanted a spiritual kingdom. So his mother said, to get this, you have to go to the personality of Godhead. Lord Brahma achieved what he achieved that way. Your grandfather, Swayamubhamanu, achieved what he achieved that way. And for you to do what you want, you're going to have to get the mercy of the personality of Godhead. And she describes his form and his qualities and his, she has love for, for Krishna. So he asked her, how do I find Vishnu? And she said, I've heard the great sages, they go to the forest and somehow they find Vishnu. She didn't give him a process, she just pointed in the direction of. So off he went, little boy, heading into the forest. And he saw lots of other things shown in the painting here but he couldn't find Vishnu. But he was very determined. And somehow, we heard this, how the somehow happened, Super Soul within the heart of Narada prompted that drove us off in the forest wanting to find Vishnu, so go pay him a visit. 
and see what you can do to help him. So Narada appeared, and Narada touched Dhruva with his hand and benedicted him. And then, knowing what Dhruva's purpose was, he started giving very detailed instructions. And we discussed a little bit yesterday this phrase, Parikshita, or Pariksha. He was examining Dhruva's determination. And if one is going to give a shiksha or instructions to someone, it's a, it's, it's a necessity, it's appropriate and it's a necessity to understand the nature of the person before you just jump in and offer shiksha. So his, his examining Dhruva was to examine his determination. And he found out, sure enough, that Dhruva's determination was, despite all the obstacles and difficulties and how it was not very likely that he would be successful, Dhruva was nonetheless determined. We covered a section yesterday, an important section, so I'm repeating it. It's a sign of an intelligent person that they take responsibility for their actions and the choices they make that precede those actions. And if by taking responsibility, then we're more likely to have responsible responses to the circumstances that life brings our way. This is just a quick review. Moving along, it's essentially what Narada said to Dhruva was give up, go home, grow up, and find peace of mind instead this way, the following peace formula. This is directly from one of the verses yesterday. One should try to keep himself satisfied in any condition of life, whether distress or happiness, which is offered by the Supreme Will. A person who endures in this way is able to cross over the darkness of nations very easily. Now, it's very common and it's a phenomena in a modern population. People get stressed out. And you bring up this topic in a public forum and there's a lot of discussion about how to handle... What about this? What about that? What about the other thing? Stress. It's, 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 with all of our advancement, it's not getting less, it's getting greater without statistics and things. Now, so this principle, this is all the way over in 4th Canto, chapter 8. The very same teaching, no surprise, was taught by Narada to Vyasadeva in Canto 1, Chapter 5. Maybe some of you know the verse. If you know the verse, you can say it with me. Tasyai vaheto prayate takovido nalambhyate yad brahmatam uparyadha talabhyate dukavad anyata sukham kalena sarvatra gabira ramhasa if you've heard Prabhupada's lectures, you've heard this verse many, many, many times. Tasyaiva heto. Heta means cause. Prayateta kovido, those who are learned or intelligent persons. Na labyate yad brahmatam. Brahmatam means wandering. Uparya, up. And adha down. Tal labyate dukavad, that's misery. Anyata sukham, happiness and distress equally come. Kalena sarvatra kabira ramhasa. Translation Persons who are actually intelligent, kovido, and philosophically inclined should endeavor only for that 
purposeful end which is not obtainable even by wandering from the topmost planet Brahmaloka down to the lowest planet Patala. So don't look for temporary. Look for that which isn't found in the realm of the temporary. As far as happiness derived from sense enjoyment is concerned, it can be obtained automatically in the course of time, just as in the course of time we obtain miseries, even though we do not desire them. So here comes misery, here comes happiness. Don't lament and don't celebrate. It's just part of the movement of time as living entities are moving in various species of life from higher places to lower places. Don't seek finding more happiness and avoiding distress because they're going to come anyway. This is this acceptance message. So what he's teaching to Drova, this was yesterday evening, was looking for the peace formula. Dhruva hears everything and he offers a response. And the response was, in essence, for those who are experiencing happiness and distress, what you're saying is perfect. Your, your teachings are perfect. The problem is, my heart has been pierced like a pot that's cracked, it doesn't hold water. My heart doesn't hold your instructions. I want a kingdom. I want a kingdom that's better than my father's kingdom. I'm better than my father's father's I want a kingdom that no one has ever achieved before. And I believe, I have faith in you, that you can help me. Please help me. Please give me a path by which I can achieve this objective. Not exactly get back, it's sakama bhakti. Bhakti performed with a motive for getting something. And his, what he wants to get is way up there. So we ended, this is, when you see this background, that means this is from the first day. This is the seven keys, key number two. Dhruva was very honest, and Narada was very kind. So the, a key lesson is these two. Be honest. We discussed it yesterday evening. Honesty and seek blessings. Now the blessings came not because he asked Narada to come, but the Supreme Lord sent Narada. The Agha Gnena Panina, we saw this twice already. The Agha, or sins, Gnena, are destroyed by the hand of Narada, the benedicting hand of Narada. And Dhruva was appreciating the benediction that was being offered to him, but he was very honest. He expressed his determination to perform austerities and request a suitable process. He was, I want this kingdom. I mean, it was, it was get back, but it was, to, I'll show them. That's Kshatriya spirit. That's the way it works with Kshatriyas. So now we're ready for this next section, achieve the Lord and receive the Lord. Here's the Sanskrit for the first verse, text 39. Maitreya, Uvancha, Maitreya is narrating all of this. This is fourth canto. And from the, the early part of the third canto, through the fourth canto, and into the fifth canto, Maitreya is narrating. To Vidura. And Shukadev Goswami is narrating what Maitreya said to Vidura, and Sutta is narrating what Shukadeva is narrating, what Maitreya is narrating to Vidura. So here's Maitreya Ovacha. See in the um, colored letters, the pri, Pritaha and Anukampaya. These are characteristics of Narada, adjectives describing Narada. 
Anukampaya is um, very compassionate. Anukampam. You know, Anukampam Sukhsamikshamano, one of our prayers. The, the merciful spiritual master is very compassionate. So here's the translation. The sage Maitreya continued, the great personality Narada Muni, upon hearing the words of Dhruva Maharaj, became very compassionate toward him. And in order to show him his causeless mercy, Pritaha, he gave him the following expert advice. So he tested, he examined his determination, he saw he's over the top. There's not he's he's very clear what he wants and in good advice. He's not disrespecting the good advice, but he has a, a chatriya spirit. So let me give him this is important. Let me give him the means to get what he wants in such a way that he'll no longer want it. I'll say that again. Let me give him the means to get what he wants, but in such a way that he will no longer want it. There's a nice verse, among many, in Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 5, Chapter 19, a celebrated verse, where uh, the residents of Jambudweep Honor Lord Hari because one of the sections of Jambudweep is Hari Varsha. It's a tract of land where Hari is worshipped. So Hari says, when people approach me in devotion, wanting something, this is the Sakama Bhakti, uh, I don't grant what they want. However, if I do grant what they want, I grant it in such a way they'll no longer come back to me with their wants. They, you know, they follow the path to the yellow brick road and there comes Lord Hari and Lord Hari gives me what I want. So I, every time I want something, I go to Lord Hari. No. I'll fulfill, if I fulfill their desire, Narda's, Dhruva's desire was fulfilled. But I'll give them their desire, fulfillment, in such a manner they'll never come again. That is, material desire is made zip. And how is that? Because I'll give them my two lotus feet. It's a nice verse. And that's the compassion. Nara's advising, Dhruva, don't go for it. And instead, be accepting of your circumstance, etc. And good advice, Dhruva's response, good advice, but I want my kingdom. Can you give me a, an honest means by which I can achieve that? So he's tested. The Shiksha Guru has tested the student. He's very clear what his capacity is. And so he gives him a means to achieve what he wants. Dhruva was a child, and so his demand was that of a playful child. I want a kingdom better than my father's father's father. A childish, playful wish. Narda is the foremost spiritual master. Naturally, his only activity is to bestow the greatest benefit upon whomever he meets. His greatest benefit is not just fulfilled desires, but the greatest benefit is bhakti. That's Narda. Compassion of a spiritual master goes beyond our involvement in the modes of passion because his retaliation... Kshatriya spirit, mode of passion. So his determination, fulfill my mode of passion, obsession. 
Okay. But beyond that is the the greatest gift. That's Narada Muni, again and again and again. And Narada's involvement with living entities of this world, he does it again and again. So here's the next verse. The great sage Narada told Dhruva, the instruction given by your mother, Suniti, to follow the path of devotional service to the Supreme Personality of Godhead is just suitable for you. You should therefore completely absorb yourself in the devotional service of the Lord. So he wasn't ready to set aside his material kama, sa, kama, but focus on the bhakti. That's what his mother advised, and Narada is confirming what his mother advised. Because his mother was a great personality, and she had faith in the personality of Godhead. And Narada is confirming what your mother said was right. Now, what was it that he wanted? He wanted a realm beyond Lord Brahma's abode. What's that? That's the spiritual world which can only be fulfilled by worshipping Krishna. You can't go to the spiritual world without worshipping Krishna. When Krishna offers anything, it is beyond the expectation of the devotee. So this image is meant to show one universe, the structure of one universe, and the topmost planet within this one universe is Brahmaloka, and down below Brahmaloka there's 13 other planetary systems. And he wanted what was beyond Brahmaloka. So here's within little detail, because it's, it's coming up, you'll see, as we get further into this Leela. There's the seven upper and the seven lower. And you know, we're familiar with the three of the seven upper, Bhu, Bhuvar, Svar, or Svargaloka, just as in, in the Gayatri Mantra, Brahma Gayatri Mantra. Bhu Loka, Bhuvar Loka, Svarga Loka, that's heaven. And above the heaven, there's Maharloka, Janaloka, Tapaloka. Sometimes in the scriptures, it's referred to as Muni Loka. Muni because great sages, beyond the desire for heavenly enjoyment, they go to these three, one of three upper places. And there's details described in Brihat Bhagavatamrita. And then above that is Brahmaloka. So that's the seven upper planetary system. So he was he wasn't wanting just you know the earth realm, Buloka. I wanted to be king in place of my father. He wants beyond Brahmaloka. Now this beyond Brahmaloka, the position of what's beyond Brahmaloka this is a, a drawing taken directly from Dhanavir Maharaja's book when he studied cosmology. While Satiputta was doing his work, before there was a TOVP, Satiputta was assigned by Prabhupada to make a plan for the Temple of Vedic Planetarium by studying the fifth canto, etc., he spent like 12 years and came up with the plan. While Satiputta was doing that work, not specifically requested by Prabhupada, but because he had an interest in the topic, and you know, being the kind of person he was, he wanted to make sure that the plan that's going to be the TOVP that Prabhupada wanted matched uh, what scholars from the Sri Sampradaya and Bhadra Sampradaya, etc., 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 what they say, because they're going to come and take a look at this thing, and they're going to critique it and say, you know, thumbs up or thumbs down. So that was one of his motives. He wanted something that's going to pass the litmus test of other Sampradaya Acharyas. Because, so it turns out that he interviewed many that in different Sampradayas, there are persons, that's all they do from, from their childhood until, you know, their mature age of sadhus, sadhu life. 
they just absorb themselves in cosmology. So they have charts and they have terminology and a lot of insight into a very mysterious topic. So this is one of the diagrams from that book that Dhanavir Maharaj wrote. And what it shows is Dhruvaloka at the very top, that blue globe at the very top. And then what you see coming from that blue globe at the top is these lines. And these lines, it's described on the right side, each of those lines is ropes of air described in the fifth canto of the Bhagavatam. And those ropes of air connect the various planets. Some of them are large. Some of them are smaller clusters called nakshatras. There's 28 nakshatras or constellations of stars that are used in Vedic astrology and astronomy and the phases of the moon is passing through those different nakshatras, 28 in number. So that's how, like, tomorrow's a codice. It's when the moon is passing through one of the nakshatras, without the detail, because it's very complicated. But that's within fifth canto, and it's certainly within the whole of uh, Vedic cosmology. And those ropes of air are being moved by a cos cos cosmology wind called the Dakshina Vara wind. And the Dakshina Vara wind blows the ropes of air and thus the planets move around Dhruvaloka. I'll say it again, so listen carefully. According to Vedic cosmology, Bhuvar Loka, Bhu, Bhuvar and Swarga Loka, those three planetary systems move in a clockwise direction, vertically, up and down, but nonetheless they move in a clockwise direction circumambulating Dhruvaloka. They circumambulate Dhruvaloka just like we circumambulate Tulsi Devi with our right side to Tulsi Devi. So they move with their right side moving around Dhruvaloka below but moving with circumambulating the spiritual planet within this universe and their movement is through ropes of air being blown by a universal air that moves in this clockwise direction. It's part of Vedic cosmology. And the, the this text here is directly from his book. It's Dhruva Loka, sometimes called the pole star, sometimes in some languages called Polaris. It's a certain number of yojanas, or 30 million four hundred thousand miles above the sun. And then the sun is a certain distance above the earth, but the earth, the this is just a cosmology discussion. We'll get into it further as we go along because Dhruva attains Dhruva Loka. The sun, the movement of the sun In the course of one solar year, the course of one solar year, the sun movement is counterclockwise, while the movement of the sun by the Kala Chakra of the Wheel of Time, in the course of 24 hours, the sun moves completely orbiting on the wheel of time. That's the day and night calculation the movement of the sun. And the movement of the year is the sun moves very slowly counterclockwise. The movements of the sun, according to Vedic cosmology, is both. I'll say it again. 
the movement of the sun, according to Vedic cosmology, moves with the wheel of time very swiftly. In 24 hours, the whole circumambulation takes place in 24 hours. The wheel of time moves that fast. And the wheel of time does something, doesn't it? The wheel of time destroys things. At material it doesn't destroy things spiritual. But it brings things into being and it brings it the destruction of all things. Time creates and annihilates. And the measure is the measure of the movement of the sun. And simultaneously the move the sun is moving in a counterclockwise direction, slowly, on the chariot. In the Bhagavatam when Prikshit Maharaj is hearing this description from Shukadeva Goswami, he says, wait a minute, you said clockwise, now you're saying counterclockwise. How to understand this? I mean, not like you're contradicting yourself. He didn't say that. He asked how to understand this. Listen to the explanation. It's very simple. He said, Shukadeva Goswami said, picture the movement of a potter's wheel. And there's an ant on the potter's wheel, and the potter's wheel is moving very quickly in a clockwise direction. So you can say the ant is moving quickly in a clockwise direction. And supposing that ant is walking very slowly in a counterclockwise direction. So we can say his movement, the ant's movement is counterclockwise. That's, that was his explanation. So the clockwise motion of the sun is Kala Chakra. The counterclockwise is the sun being carried, the sun god being carried by the sun god's chariot, which means the sun is being carried by the chariot of the sun god in a counterclockwise direction, very slowly, and in the course of approximately one year, one solar year, that motion is complete. And thus we have day and night and years. And then there's months as the sun is passing through various constellations. It's a, it's a little complex, but that's Vedic cosmology. And what you see in the center, that blue dolphin, you see the blue dolphin? Uh, there's a Sanskrit name for that guy. And uh, it's described in the Bhagavatam, in the commentary to the fifth canto Bhagavatam, that it's an imaginary depiction of the heavenly planets as they're situated in moving. There's a particular name, and that name is, at least in uh, our, our Gaudiya Vaishnava tradition, our Prabhupada has translated as dolphin, and some of the other uh, South Indian sampradayas, they identify it as a scorpion. And our TOVP director has a different name. It's, a, it's the carrier of uh, Varuna. In any case, it's, it's, it's meant in Vedic cosmology to indicate the heavenly planets in their particular orbital around and moving around Dhruvaloka. All of this is Dhruvaloka. Dhruva is destined to go to Dhruvaloka. He is not called Dhruvaloka yet. But Nard is giving him a plan to fulfill his desire, which is fulfilled. He goes eventually to Dhruvaloka. Narada Muni was very pleased with Dhruva Maharaj. This is Prabhupada's purport. And he could have at once personally given whatever he wanted, but that is not the duty of the spiritual master. His duty is to engage the disciple in proper devotional service 
as prescribed in the Shastras. So that's a, a nice teaching also about being a friend or being a parent. It's not just doing something for people because they say, can you do this for me? You may do that, but in, in, in a general sense, it's helping someone become qualified to do something. So now they have the skill to do something and achieve something and be in their relationship with the personality of Godhead as a result of doing and achieving with dependency upon the personality of Godhead. So Narada Muni is continuing. Any person who desires the fruits of the four principles, Dharma, Artha, Kama, Moksha, should engage himself in the devotional service of the Supreme Personality of Godhead for worship of his lotus feet yields the fulfillment of all of these so whatever position one is in, worship the personality of Godhead. In the same verse, Narada says, well, this is, so this is a, 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 a diagram showing Dharma, Artha, Kama, Moksha, and the person who's following the Vedas. The same idea, same idea, taught by Shukadev Goswami to Maharaj Prikshit in Canto 2, Chapter 3. Celebrated verse. You know the verse? Akama sarva kamova moksha kama udaradi tivrena bhakti yogena yajeta purusham param Whether one is in the akama, no material desire, Sarva kama, all material desire. Moksha kama, desiring liberation. Udara d, d means intelligence, and udara means broad. The broad, those with broad intelligence, whether it's this, that, or the other, kama, tivra bhakti, is recommended. So Drew was ready. So Narada Muni is going to give him a process. That's what he was requested to give. So he's going to give a process of devotional service suited for Dhruva to achieve what he wants. So it's very detailed. You should go to the bank of the Yamuna where there is a virtuous forest named Madhuvan and there be purified. So he gave him a place to go. My dear boy, in the waters of the Yamuna River, which is known as Kalindi, you should take three baths daily because the water is very auspicious, sacred, and clear. After bathing, you should perform the necessary regulative principles for Ashtanga Yoga, because it's such a yoga, that's the means for that age, and then sit down on your asana in a calm and quiet position. Then, after sitting on your seat, practice the three kinds of breathing exercises, pranayama, and thus gradually control the life air, prana, the mind, and the senses. That's steps in the direction of the final thing. Completely free yourself from all material contamination and with great patience begin to meditate on the Supreme Personality of Godhead because that's what the Ashtanga Yoga system is meant for, not just you know, learning asanas and pranayama and becoming a vegetarian and other things like that that some people do. Narada begins to describe details of that process. He mentions Madhavan because it is the chief of all holy places. That's Prabhupada's purport. On the right side is a photograph of Dhruvatila. And you notice there's steps going up. 
when the very first day we saw the deity that's at the top of this hill, or Dhruva Tila, and um, it's, that's where Dhruva underwent the austerities that he was doing. Now, at the bottom of the hill, some distance, not so far, the river Jamuna used to flow, so three times a day he'd come down from the hill and take his bath and go back up and do his what Nard is instructing him. So along with the Ashtanga yoga process, he's describing the meditation on the form of Krishna. The Lord's face is perpetually very beautiful and pleasing in attitude. To the devotees who see him, he appears never to be displeased. And he is always prepared to award benedictions to them. His eyes, his nicely decorated eyebrows, his raised nose, and his broad forehead are all very beautiful. He is more beautiful than all the demigods. Now comes a little reflection exercise because of our time. I have to cover a lot of territory today, so I'm not going to make the request that you we pause and write stuff down, but you can take note. Um, think of an incident where you might have been you had missed or neglected to fulfill an instruction or engage in spiritual practices. Recollect how, despite this shortcoming, you felt unconditional acceptance by your spiritual guides or your spiritual master. It says write it down, but you can, well, I'll pause a bit, you can reflect. Write your feelings at this present time while recalling their unconditional acceptance. So I'm going to pause. You can reflect. Dhruva was feeling this because he had Narada said yeah but Dhruva said you're right but it doesn't stay in my heart so can you give me that means by which I can achieve this unprecedented wish fulfillment and uh, Narada gave him. So he's, he's naturally feeling profound gratitude because Narada is just pouring it on him. How can one be unconditionally accepting of others? That's a nice lesson. And are there any examples you can think of from scriptures? So let's see if there's anybody here that has some examples from Scripture. Unconditional acceptance. Lord Ramachandra, Lord Ramachandra accepting division. Okay. I'll just say two sentences. Vibhishan was Ravana's brother. So guilt by association would perhaps be the view. But Vibhishan left. And Vibhishan was trying and trying and several times trying to dissuade Ravana from his diabolical kidnapping of Sita and so many other things. But he was insulted 
by Ravana. So he left. And he came to take shelter of Lord Ramachandra. Many, many you know, opinions were consulted and Ramachandra unconditionally accepted him. Ramachandra said, even if Ravana, after all of what he's done, if he came before me just now and said, please accept me, I would accept him unconditionally. Nice example. Any other? Yes. Yes. Nice example. Nice example. Yes, go ahead. Unbelievable. Okay. Anyone else? Yeah. Nityananda approved accepting uh, Madai and Jagai. Fantastic. Fantastic. Okay, so it's there's scriptural examples. Now, how can we become like that? By having a strong, unbreakable connection with the personality of God. It, using Prabhupada's terms, know thyself or know yourself means know you, your connection with the personality of Godhead. And if feeling that connection, then one can easily be accepting of others. Then we're going to move on. Narada continues describing Krishna's form. The Lord's form is always youthful. Every limb and every part of his body is properly formed, free from defect. His eyes and lips are pinkish, like the rising sun. He is always prepared to give shelter to the surrendered soul. And anyone so fortunate as to look upon him feels all satisfaction. The Lord is always worthy to be the master of the surrendered soul. He is the ocean of mercy. Narada sounds pretty intimately uh, familiar with the Lord's form and his qualities. The Lord is further described as having the mark of Srivatsa, or the sitting place of the goddess of fortune, and his bodily hue is deep bluish. The Lord is a person. He wears a garland of flowers, and he e is eternally manifest with four hands, which hold the conch wheel club and lotus flower. Now, the image sounded like it was describing Krishna, but he's specifically describing Lord Vishnu or Narayana of the spiritual world. The entire body of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Vasudev, is decorated. He wears a valuable jeweled helmet necklaces and bracelets. His neck is adorned with the Kastuba jewel and he is dressed in yellow silk garments. The Lord is decorated with small golden bells around his waist and his lotus feet are decorated with golden ankle bells. All his bodily features are very attractive and pleasing to the eyes. He is always peaceful, calm, and quiet, and very pleasing to the eyes and to the mind. Now, this is the meditation that an Ashtanga yogi is encouraged. Not meditate on a candle, or meditate on a spot on the wall, or meditate on nothing, or... Meditation upon this form of the Lord. This is Ashtanga Yoga. Real yogis, this is commentary. Real yogis meditate upon the transcendental form of the Lord 
as he stands on the whirl of the lotus of their hearts, the jewel-like nails of his lotus feet glittering. Very detailed, isn't it? The Lord is always smiling, and the devotee should constantly see the Lord in this form. This is actually verses from Narada to Dhruva. As he looks very mercifully toward the devotee, in this way, the meditator should look toward the Supreme Person of the Godhead, the bestower of all benedictions. He does all this in trance, later, Dhruva. One who meditates in this way, concentrating his mind upon the always auspicious form of the Lord, is very soon freed from all material contamination, and he does not come down from meditation upon the Lord, absorbed. He goes on, this meditation process. Entering into the lotus of the heart, in the heart of the devotees, by his two feet, which shine with jewel-like nails, he becomes situated in the jiva and his intelligence. Vishwanath Chakravarti writes, Samarchitam means of the devotees, Dishnyam means place, Atmani means in the jiva and in his intelligence. So that's what Narada was saying. This is Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur's translation and commentary. So that's the meditation part. Then comes the mantra part. Narada Muni gives him the mantra. You know what the mantra was? Yes. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Here's the text. O oh, son of the king, now I shall speak unto you the mantra, which is to be chanted with this process of meditation. One who carefully chants this mantra for seven nights can see the perfect human beings, the associates of the Lord, traveling in the sky. Try it out. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. This is the twelve-syllable mantra for worshipping Lord Krishna. Then he speaks of deity worship. One should install the physical forms of the Lord. And with the chanting of this mantra, one should offer flowers and fruits and other varieties of foodstuffs exactly according to the rules and regulations prescribed by authorities. But this should be done in consideration of place, time, and attendant conveniences or inconveniences. In other words, there's standards, but there's flexibility given your circumstance, because he's going to be off in the forest. So you can't have like a nice altar like this and all the paraphernalia and everything. Here's what Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur writes. The explanation. It is understood from this shloka that teaching Vaishnava mantra with Om to persons without Upanayanam is allowed. This supersedes the rule of giving such mantras only to those who have Upanayanam. Now this is doesn't, not so relevant to us in ISKCON, but to those who are not within ISKCON, there's rules about receiving mantra. Mantra diksha traditionally is to be done only when one has received upanayanam. Upanayanam is a procedure, particularly for young boys, particularly at a certain age of life, where they receive a sacred thread and uh, the Brahma Gayatri Mantra, there may be other mantras also given along with the Brahma Gayatri Mantra. So there are some that say other mantras are not to be given until the young boy has received Upanayanam. So 
So Vishwanath is just pointing out, here it is in the Bhagavatam, no indication of Upanayana. He's, he's not even old enough for Upanayana, but he's being given a mantra by Narada. So it's mantra diksha. Before he was shiksha, before shiksha, it was his mother. It was commented on yesterday. Three times, now it's four times. His mother was serving as a particular type of guru. Vartma Pradarshika Guru, pointing the way, the path. Narada then gave Shiksha. Now he's giving Diksha. So this Diksha, in traditional Vedic sense, means, as it says here, the Vaishnava mantra with Om, as in Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya, or in Sri Sampradaya, Om Namo Narayanaya. So this is called, without saying the whole thing, it's called the 12-syllable mantra. And it's, here's Narada, not breaking any rules. He's giving the mantra to Dhruva before he's had Upanayana. There's the mantra. And now the Hare Krishna mantra doesn't have the same rules because it doesn't begin with Om. So we can give Hare Krishna mantra to everybody and it's not breaking any Vedic rules. For those who are rule conscious, they may object. But when, if you're ever asked, you know, why do you give a Hare Krishna mantra to people that, that are, are, un, are un, impure? It doesn't have the same restrictions as the Vedic mantras that begin with Om. Sometimes you'll hear pujaris when they're reciting mantras at yagyas, they'll say Om, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. As if that makes it a Vedic mantra, but it's a Vedic mantra even without the Om in front of it. But it just doesn't have the same restriction as for everybody. Very merciful mantra. In the purport, Prabhupada writes, one should not artificially try to see the form of the Lord while chanting Hare Krishna. But when the chanting is performed offenselessly, the Lord will automatically reveal himself to the view of the chanter. The chanter, therefore, has to concentrate on hearing the vibration and Without extra endeavor on his part, the Lord will automatically appear, or may automatically appear, <laughs> but it's not exactly automatically, of his own sweet will. So the emphasis is just go on hearing. Prabhupada's further explanation, when an iron rod is made red hot in fire, it is no longer iron, it is fire. That's, you know, the... Bhakti Siddhanta calls this hearing with the spiritual ear. Comes from extended and concentrated effort. Extended means over time, and concentrated means quality. Both quantity and quality, gradually the ear the senses can become spiritualized. We just had a Japa retreat. It was a festival of the holy name, like a Japa retreat in Chicago. And there was a very nice statement made by Bhakti Siddhanta in a letter, a handwritten letter to one of his disciples. In one of the statements it was, thank you very much. I'm very happy to hear that you're becoming very enthusiastic in chanting. The effect of this chanting when done over a prolonged period of time very attentively, it has the effect of effacing, means wearing away, the, the distinction between the coverings of the soul and the soul. The body and the mind are coverings, and the soul is the seat of consciousness. And when that effacing, or the spiritualizing of the coverings becomes effective, then one can see the self. You can see the form of the soul. He's writing this in a letter to someone that's 
enthusiastic for chanting. So this is what is being said here also. Further in Prabhupada's purport, one should take consideration of the time, place, and available conveniences. This was the deity worship part. Sanatan Goswami says that as be bell metal can turn to gold when mixed with mercury in a chemical or alchemo, alchemy process, so by the bona fide diksha, the initiation method, anyone can become a Vaishnava. You recognize the person in the photograph here? Mother Jamuna? It's on stage in Jaipur where Radha Govinda are, is being installed and Srila Prabhupada in front of this whole big, look at the crowd out there, in front of, under, under the pandal, she's doing the installation ceremony. What an honor. And the, the queen is watching the whole thing. <laughs> So here we go. Now he's going to go into further detail with the deity worship process. One should worship the Lord by offering pure water, pure flower garlands, fruits, flowers, and vegetables which are available in the forest, or by collecting new, newly grown grasses, small buds of flowers, or even the skins of trees, and if possible, by offering Tulsi leaves, which are very dear to the Supreme Personality of God. This is directly a verse spoken by Narada to Dhruva, how to do deity worship off in the forest. And most important, if possible, is Tulsi. And the forms of the Lord, he goes on, it is possible to worship a form of the Lord made of physical elements, such as earth, water, pulp, wood, and metal. In the forest, one can make a form with no more than earth and water. Like, what's earth and water? Is mud. We have an example. And worship Him according to the above principles. A devotee who has full control over his self should be very sober and peaceful and must be satisfied simply with eating whatever fruits and vegetables are available in the forest. Well, Dhruva takes it beyond that. But can you think of an example where a form of the deed he was made fashioning earth and water, making a mud form of the deity. The gopis, when they wanted to have Krishna as their husband, by the side of the river Jamuna in the coldest month, January, December, January month, very, very cold before the sun came up, they fashioned, you see on the left side is the deity of Katyayani, because they're village girls, they didn't have wealth. So they took earth and water and fashioned a deity that was, after it dried, the mud became a deity form. And they made their offerings to the deity form. Here's another of the earthen deity form that they worshipped, Katyayani. My dear Dhruva, besides worshipping the deity and chanting the mantra three times a day, you should meditate upon the transcendental activities of the Supreme Personality of Godhead in his different incarnations as exhibited by his supreme will and personal potencies. So he's giving a very detailed, isn't it? He's just a little boy. How is he going to remember all this? What to speak of do all this? But he did it. In the next verse, 
one should follow in the footsteps of previous devotees regarding how to worship the Supreme Lord with the prescribed paraphernalia, or one should worship within the heart by reciting the mantra of the personality of Godhead who is not different from the mantra. So you recognize the photograph or painting on the left side. This is Prabhupada would like to tell the story. We like to hear it. It's uh, the story of a, a brahmana who was very poor, and he didn't have the financial means to worship his deity very nicely. So he was saddened by his impoverished condition. But the way Prabhupada describes it, one day he was hearing the Bhagavatam class, and he heard that one of the ways of worshiping of deity form is in the mind. So he took it seriously, and within his mind, he created a beautiful altar, and with golden pots in his mind, he gathered waters from the sacred rivers and worshipped his deity with Abhishek by bathing his deity from those sacred waters, and on and on and on, all the details and details and details, the dress and the garlands. And after the, the, the puja, he would cook for his deity in his mind, and, and then he would make the offering to the deity and have nice kirtan. And he was doing this on a regular basis, all within his mind. And one day, when he was testing to see if the sweet rice was cool enough to offer to the deity in his mind, because sweet rice should be done after cooking it, it has to cool. So he stuck his finger into the sweet rice to see if it cooled enough yet, and the sweet rice was still hot and he burned his finger. And then his meditation broke. He looked at his finger, his finger was burned. He was very surprised. And then you see up in the sky, that was Lord Vishnu coming in his vimana to take the brahmana pranto to the spiritual world because he was accepting his offerings made within his mind, his worship of the deity. Attentive hearing of the mantra while chanting is the same as worshiping the Lord in his form as the holy name. That's our teaching, and it's confirmed by Scripture. So here's a young boy. Do you recognize this deity that's in this painting? Anybody recognize the deity? Shakshi huh? Shakshi, Shakshi Gopal. Mm -hmm. Now, you can't take pictures of Shakshi Gopal unless you're sneaky. <laughs> I know somebody that did it. I won't tell you how they did it but it was sneaky. This is uh, the, the form of Shakshi Gopal in a painting. So a little boy is worshipping Shakshi Gopal. Anyone who thus engages in the devotional service of the Lord seriously and sincerely with his mind, words, and body and who is fixed in the activities of the prescribed devotional methods is blessed by the Lord according to his desire. So, Dhruva's got a desire, a big-time material desire, and he's being given a process, an honest process, because that's what he asked, by which the Lord can be pleased, and then his desires can be fulfilled. If a devotee desires material, religiosity, economic, dharma, the kama moksha again, from the material world, he is awarded these results. If one is very serious about liberation, he must stick to the process of transcendental loving service, engaging 24 hours a day. Good luck, right? In the highest ecstasy, highest stage of ecstasy, and he must certainly be aloof from all activities of sense gratification. So we're nearly ending this section of Narada's instructions. 
When Dhruva Maharaj, the son of the king, was thus advised by the great sage Narada, he circumambulated Narada, his spiritual master, and offered him respectful obeisances. Then he started from Madhuvan, which is always imprinted with the lotus footprints of Lord Krishna, and which is therefore especially auspicious. This is an important step in the evolution from Sakkama to Nishkam Bhakti. A very important step in becoming freed from material desires, which we all have, to get to the position where there's no material desires remaining or complete attachment to the personality of Godhead. This benediction given by Narada, given by a qualified person, such as Narada, and then the feelings that Dhruva has towards Narada. It's, it's an imperative, it's an essential feature of going beyond material and getting to all spiritual desire. The sense of profound gratitude. He's feeling that because he's got a big, big, big material desire and big, big, big determination to fulfill the material desire. But he's going to get on the other side of the material desire and just have still determination remaining. So profound gratitude to the profound mercy that's being bestowed upon him, exhibited by his circumambulating Narada three times, and off he goes to Madhavan. Since this pastime took place during Swayambhuva Manvantar, though he appears much later in Vaivasvata Manvantar, Krishna's footprints are there because Mathura is eternal. You follow what that's saying? This is in Swayambhuva Manu's period. And he's, he's being appreciated that this place, Madhavan, is especially auspicious because of Krishna's footprints. But Krishna doesn't appear to seven Manus later. And the explanation from our Acharyas is that's because Krishna is eternal and the place is eternal and his footprints are eternal. His auspiciousness is eternal. He's getting that eternal benefit although he's not seeing those footprints. Hari in this verse also refers to Krishna since his presence is well known in Shruti. Since Krishna was the object of Dhruva's worship, being the deity of his 12-syllable mantra, he went there from elsewhere. He went to Madhavan because that was the deity of his mantra. That's what Jiva Goswami writes. And that's the end of this section. And let's see if there's some discussion. And then we'll take a break. Let's see if there's some discussion. I see there's one hand. Are you going to do the, take the microphone around? Yeah. Okay. Raise your hand again, please. Hare Krishna. Please accept my humble obeisances. Hare Krishna. Um, you're on. Just could you okay. take your mask down because while you're speaking, it'll be easier to hear. Thanks. Okay. Uh, my question is about the Om word itself. Um, many of the yogas now, contemporary yoga practices, people just take Om yes. word just like that. Yes, they do. Was it uh, supposed to be, um, it should be given to you or something like that? Yes. Or, so this is not correct that anybody can just... Well, it's not it. harmful. It's just not, you're not going to get the full benefit. Okay. It's a sacred sound. Pranabhak Sarva Vedishu. It's in the Vedas. It's, it's a sound representation of the Supreme Lord. So there's benefit. No harm. Okay. Full benefit, no. Benefit, yes. Okay. okay. Someone else? Sorry. 
So um, I was thinking about mask. Okay. So Maraj, you mentioned that um, there are less, there are fewer qualifications for the chanting of the Hare Krishna mantra because um, it doesn't begin with Om, and uh, each morning in Iskand temples we recite the ten offenses to the holy name, including to instruct faithless persons about the glory of the holy name. And um, I just wondered if you could shed some light on kind of the 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 difference or the line between giving someone the mantra and in, encouraging them to chant it versus instructing them about its glories. Because I feel it might be like almost a catch-22 where someone may not be inclined to chant in, until they have some shraddha. But to get that, you may have to instruct them on the glories of the Holy Name. That, you know, that may help them develop their faith. So... My answer to this question and many of your questions is, it depends. Meaning, what you know, instructing people about the glories of the Holy Name can mean different things depending upon the person and the circumstance. That's where it depends. So, like on our, our mantra cards, chant to be happy. That's a starting point. Chant and be happy. Or chant and be become free from your material distress. That's a glory. But it's not the intimate glories. It's not A to Z on the glories of the Holy Name. For, for a beginner that's faithless, or at least neutral, if not, not faithless, we don't describe the intimate messages that are embedded within the names of Krishna. But it's, it depends on the person and their, their, their degree of faith, their degree of receptivity. It's like the same message to examine the person before giving instructions. Because you can say general things, and that's just fine. That's how our founder Acharya instructed us, chant and be happy. I mean, if you got a book published, chant and be happy. And chant what? Chant the Hare Krishna mantra and be happy. And then there's some sayings. But it's not the, in, it's not the intimate glories, it's a book for the public. So it depends on the re receiver. Now, if they, if, if they have... It depends upon their faith. And you could say you know, a little bit of where they are in their spiritual trajectory to calibrate what you can say, to nourish that faith further. But something that everybody likes is to be happy. So chant to be happy. Thank you, Maharaj. Okay. Someone else? Somebody over here. You had your hand up. You had your hand No. Okay. Krishna Maharaj, uh, regarding chanting the holy name again, you mentioned uh, one of the slides says, just hear, rather than uh, one should not uh, artificially fix one mind or meditate one mi one's oneself upon the form of the Lord, rather one should hear the holy name attentively. So, so I, we hear that... Um, I'm, like, you, uh, you, the, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm pausing you just now because... The way that you said what you said could be confusing or misleading. Mm -hmm. So if, if the rest of the question is based on the premise that's a little confusing, then I, have to, I feel I have to interrupt. Sure. It's not that when you're chanting, you cannot, should not. Rather, if you do... If the thought of the form of the Lord is there, or you see the deity form of the Lord, it, or something, if one is very advanced, it's not that you should not see the form of the Lord that appears in your heart. Rather, the message is, 
don't d- don't become dissuaded from hearing because that's the mm-hmm. primary thing that was my question <laughs> you answered it okay thank you any anybody else okay so what's next on the schedule Madhava Hari, are you here? He's in the kitchen. What's the schedule? Prashadam. Okay. Is everybody ready for Prashadam? I hope you found a place to park your car. A little different venue than we're used to, isn't it? Quite remote. But it's for you guys to be remote and be with nature yeah <laughs> no but we said to be in nature this location was selected for you guys um it was selected for me huh um he doesn't like the location because of most of it <laughs> i can't hear you could you speak into the microphone um he doesn't like the location because he doesn't like it Yeah, because of most of the animals here. You don't like the animals? <laughs> You're squealing on your brother. Okay, Shila Prabhupada ki yeah. Yeah. What time What time should we come back? It's 12:30. Half an hour. Eat quickly. <laughs> So we're going to resume at one o'clock, even if whether you're here or not here, we're going to resume at one o'clock. I hope that's okay.